Okay, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, yeah, I see I recognize a lot of people here, so thank you for coming. But um, now today we're going to talk about investing offshore, which I think is very topical. Uh, as Simon said, we're going to try and keep it to an hour, but I think we'll push it seven minutes extra. So we'll do like the, the six, this is my 67 minutes for, for the day. And ironically, we're going to talk about moving money out of South Africa. Um, yeah, so uh, there we go. Yeah, so basically, um, you know, the, the first thing that uh, I want to cover is like, okay, so if we've not, not so good. Okay, but what, what I first want to uh, discuss is why, why do we invest offshore? And the fact is that, uh, ah, there we go. Um, South Africa makes up a very small percentage of the global GDP. And I mean, there's all sorts of people that are very pessimistic and, you know, think South Africa is doomed and that we've got to get money out at all costs. But there, there are good arguments for moving money offshore and there are bad arguments for moving money offshore. And I wanted to kind of explore them today. So to do that, I first want to just kind of explore what's happening in the South African markets currently. Um, I want to look at the pros and cons of investing offshore, but specifically through the local exchange. So we do a lot of flow overseas directly, but there is huge benefits to doing it locally as well. And you need to understand when to do it locally and when to do it offshore, because there are very... I said very severe consequences if you do it incorrectly. Um, we're going to look at some of the products that are available on the exchange. So there's a couple of different classes of product that you can do that will give you offshore exposure um, without having to, you know, actually take physical currency out. Um, we're going to look at some of the regulation as well. So some of the the, the tax control regulate the tax uh, the tax regulation, some of the exchange control regulation as well. And then we're going to pick a couple of products. So there's a couple of very interesting products that that the, that are on the local market, and that's kind of where we're going to finish hopefully in uh, 67 minutes, maybe a little bit longer if we get more more presentation. Maybe I'll just hit the button over here. Okay. Um, yeah. So the first, the first thing is like, why, why do you want to invest offshore? And, and when we see clients, there's basically three buckets that the clients will fall into. So there's, and there's different, I suppose, attitudes as to why you want to invest offshore. So the first and very reasonable, re like idea is that you want to diversify your asset base, which is, is a perfectly legitimate reason for wanting to get offshore exposure. If you want to, um, you know, if you look at your life currently, you probably have a house here. You probably have your, your, a lot of investments here as well, because if you're looking at Reg Regulation 28 money, that money has to sit, uh, at least the majority of that money has to sit locally. Uh, all property assets that you own, holiday homes, those are all assets locally as well. Um, so the idea of investing offshore makes sense. The idea that you should just rampantly run offshore with your money is maybe a little bit overblown if you follow certain Twitter accounts, um, because at the same time, your costs are local as well. Like you are still South Africans. You still, I'm assuming, because you've come to a South African presentation. The other kind of idea that clients have when they, they invest offshore is they say offshore has better performance than, than the local markets, which over the last five years has definitely been true. Not necessarily true in terms of all markets. So uh, there's a wonderful graph I haven't put in the presentation showing S&P 500 versus just about all other global markets. And you'll see South Africa, while we've underperformed many markets, if you continually compare to the S&P 500, sure, we've underperformed by a large margin, but emerging markets have been under pressure as well. It's not always true. Um, I think Simon actually tweeted, a, it was a tweet yesterday saying that the, the RAND is currently at the same level it was now since, I think, 2001. Sure, that was in a spike, you know, in a dramatic event, but um, essentially... There's also a lot of risk to, to just investing, thinking that the, the only improvement in performance that you're going to have is a continually weakening currency. That is also not a smart investment. And we see a lot of clients that come to us and you'll say, what have you got? I've got some funds offshore and the funds have been sitting in a dollar, you know, as a dollar deposit in an offshore bank since 2001 doing nothing. I mean, there's a huge opportunity cost to doing that. And then there's, of course, the the reason that a lot of people come as well, they want to pay less tax. And they've got this idea that if I invest offshore, there's these things called tax havens and I can squirrel away money and no one's going to know about it. And, you know, we, we're not going to, you know, basically the tax man's not going to get his due and why should I pay tax anyway? And that's, that's the attitude. That is probably the least important reason to go offshore and also the le and, and the reason with the most inaccurate information around it. You know, tax havens certainly are a thing. For many years, tax havens have been utilized in a lot of different ways. You look at the Panama Papers recently and you look at the rise of global CRS, so the Common Reporting Standard, it is not easy to hide money these days. Um, tax havens are on an enormous amount of pressure to, to reveal what, what is there. And the tax havens that have 
you know, a regulatory status that is, I suppose, malleable enough to actually get away with that kind of stuff, you end up in the kind of products that it's no longer on your balance sheet. You kind of sitting there going, how safe is my money? Yes, it's obscured. And yes, I'm not paying tax on it. But what are the, the actual risks underneath that, uh, that type of investment? So there are ways to obviously you know, if make efficiently reduce your tax rate. But the fact is that you probably can't just evade tax by moving offshore. And that's a, that's a huge fallacy that we've got to dispel immediately. Um, if we look at offshore, like the valid reason is very much, uh, you know, the world is a big place. If you look at this little purple, little purple thing there, that's basically the GDP of Africa. South Africa, this is 2017 numbers, uh, just because it came with a pretty chart. Uh, is 0.44%. So just about half a percent, just getting towards half a percent. I think we're at 0.59 on latest figures of global GDP. There is a lot of options overseas to, to go for. Um, you can see the, the heavyweight, certainly US and China. Um, so what are the current state of the South African uh, investment markets? I think these this, this page shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. Uh, this, I was going to, I just had it as a placeholder when I was doing it. It was called the scary statistics page. And I was going to go and find a whole lot. And I thought, no, that's quite a nice name for the, the page. Um, and it is, I mean, these are all the latest numbers. You look at uh, our GDP growth rates, we've been flat and, and, and almost negative. We look at our unemployment rate, 27.6 currently. If you look at youth unemployment, it's even worse. Uh, manufacturing PMI below 50, that means our manufacturing sector is contracting. Also very, very dire warning side. Inflation, pretty good, pretty good. Um, yeah, it's the one institution in South Africa that is really doing well, which is the Reserve Bank. Having the governor reappointed, I think, has given him a little bit more, uh, I suppose, political clout. Uh, and I think he's going to be under a little bit less pressure, um, you know, from, from kind of the public announcements. But uh, inflation, 4.5. We obviously got a 25 basis point rate cut today. I think a lot of people were hoping for, for 50. And the, the fact that we only got 25 actually saw the RAND strengthening a little bit today. Uh, debt to GDP also bad. Business confidence, that's a number between, you know, that's been as high as it's been above 80. We, it's pretty dire. But this shouldn't come as a shock to anyone. These numbers are, you know, well understood. Everyone understands this. A lot of this is in the price of the shares that, that you're buying and the investments. This, this is the known information. It's not necessarily a reason to panic and move. Uh, it is certainly painting a picture, though. The one argument that I, I do think holds sway as to why potentially offshore markets and specific offshore markets could perform better for you over time than, than, than a local market, um, is, this is this is a graph of, of high school throughput. It's basically the educational situ situation in South Africa. So of the, call it 1.2 million uh, uh, grade ones that started in 2005, you can go through kind of the numbers of how the, each graduates and it comes down. By the time you get to kind of a, a tertiary degree, you're at 13% of the people that entered grade one. Matric maths pass rate above 50%, 4.5%. It's very, very low. And that is concerning when you're looking for new businesses to be started, innovative businesses that are growth businesses that we want to come to market. We want our entrepreneurs to come and list on the JSE. And you want those businesses to grow and, and help us propel our stock market higher, which is what stock market investors are looking for. That, for me, is a very scary statistic. That's far more scary than you know, infl yeah, unemployment. These are, these are in the price. We understand the issues there structurally. This is something that like you need to take into account. Again, just looking at maths and science, which we, we always look at as a, as a fairly good gauge of, uh, I suppose, like innovation and the ability to produce high quality human, human capital. Currently out of 140 countries, South Africa is rated 128. This is the last of the depressing stuff. <laughs> but um, 128 out of 140, that is incredibly poor. We look at the USA, and we think the US education system is not great, but it's still, it still ranks number 10 globally. Um, you look at where the biggest and most innovative companies are in the world, and they are, I think, well, there is no surprise. Hold on, let me go here. There's no surprise that you're going to find them, obviously, in the USA. Uh, so here... There we go. So these are the kind of big companies. And, and the one argument that holds sway for me that, that makes me think that the best investment decision that you can potentially make is to look at an international exposure and, and look at international equity markets rather than local equity markets, despite the extended valuation of, a, of an index like the S&P 500, um, is because it contains things like Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet. And now if you compare these companies to basically economies, you know, we're thinking about our, our entire country is 0.8. 
we call it 0.5% of global GDP. If you look at um, Alphabet, so that's Google, Google's parent company, uh, it's the, you know, if you compare its market cap to the GDP, which is maybe not an exactly fair comparison, but um, it gives you an idea, it's as big as 38 African countries put together. That's one company. Uh, if you look at, you know, Amazon, nine South American companies, you look at Microsoft is just about as big as Eastern Europe. Uh, these are massive companies. What propelled them to grow as big as they did? Where did that stellar growth come from? It came from incredible human human capital. The ability for people to move, and uh, uh, look, I mean, it's something we chat about often in the office. The best and brightest minds in the world, and many of the, the executives of these companies are not American-born. It's that America manages to attract and import talent. It's not that South Africa doesn't have talent. We had some of the, the brightest minds, one of them being Elon Musk. But he's doing his thing in America, and the company that is he's, he's listed is sitting in America currently. So to have exposure to these kinds of companies is important if you want to capture this long-term growth. Now, the difference is, in the old days, every every single economy had its own um, had its own set of um, how can you say it? Like each economy had its its own each country at least had its own set of companies that were fulfilling the the the, the the, the need. So let's say Toyota in Japan, BMW in Germany, Ford in America. What's happening these days is if you, if you sorry, if we go back, I don't want to click backwards and forwards too much, but if you go back, you'll see that a lot of these companies are fulfilling global needs all at once. Uh, like hands up quickly, like how many people use Microsoft products here? Everyone. How many people use a Visa card? Some people might have MasterCard, you know, so like half. Like how many people Google instead of, I don't know, do we have a South African search engine? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's very quick. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, even now, like I look at I look at a company like Amazon. Ah, brilliant. Um, even now, I look at a company like Amazon. My friends now are telling me that, like, I mean, I don't do a lot of online shopping, but they're saying to me that uh, it's now faster for them if they go on Amazon to have something delivered from the U.S. If they go and buy, you know, two mouse pads, one from one from Amazon, one from Take a Lot, even though Take a Lot's coming from a DC down in Cape Town, the Amazon one arrives first. I mean, that's incredible. That is absolutely incredible, and the the dominance of these American companies is is astounding. Um, you want to capture growth like that. And I believe that you should want to capture growth like that as a private retail investor. <laughs> Simon, what have you done to me? <laughs> oh, there we go. So is now a good time to do so. I've put this chart in as well. So this is kind of like we did it uh, last night. Um, it's a, yeah, it's basically a, like a, a currency chart just to give you an idea. Uh, currently at about 14, I was saying to some guys before the presentation, uh, we run basically an offshore treasury desk. We felt, you know, when, when the, the thing, when the currency blew out about 15, 20, I mean, we were, try we were kind of saying like bottom of that range over there, you know, if you can get out at kind of 13, 20 to 13, 50, this is probably a good time to look at externalizing funds. Uh, we couldn't beg guys to move because at that stage it was coming down and everyone was looking at that bottom line at about, let's say, 12.50. And they were saying, we're going to wait for 12.50. We couldn't beg guys to take money out or look at offshore investments. As soon as uh, we got that blow out of 15.20, now at like 14.20, the phone started ringing again. And that desk just became incredibly busy. And as as we got to 14.20, now we've just broken 14 again. Like I said, an, another little bit of strength now. We're seeing that volume pick up. So there's certainly still an appetite to move funds offshore. Um, but there is, a, yeah, and I mean, we did, again, relationships, just if you're trying to time the currency on this kind of stuff. Uh, if you go back to, say, 1994, which is an important date, and 1976, which is another important date, both give you about a 6% uh, per year weakening against the U.S. dollar on average. So you're essentially weakening, you know, the long-term like uh, a relationship is that you're weakening by basically the interest rate differential to, to the U.S. market. It does hold true. So, you know, when you get a, a strengthening, I suppose, of just about 8% from, from the, the, the near-term high, I think that's when guys look at it and go, oh, that's a year's worth of interest in, on a RAND balance. Let's shift to a dollar balance instead. But, um, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit on the currency. Why, should you move offshore? I think we, we're looking at decent levels now. I think it might get a little bit better, but timing currency is always very, very difficult. Okay, so before we go into the exact products, I just want to go through some of the tax and the exchange control and the, the other regulations for that, that face offshore investors. So the typical, the typical offshore investor will come and they basically want to do just, they want to use the, the exchange controls. So I'll go through what exchange controls are. You guys might, not, might know them. If you're in your personal name, 
it means you can take one million uh, using a single discretionary allowance. You don't need a tax clearance. You literally, like you speak to a bank, like you can do it through your bank directly. We obviously, like I said, we run a treasury desk. Rance was really simple to do it. You open an account, you deposit the money, and we put it anywhere in the world for you. Uh, it can go 60, I think 60 different currencies that, that you can do it in. Uh, no need to, like we report the BOP form to, obviously, we report the, the, the transfer to the Reserve Bank, but you don't need to any sort of clearance. If you're going above a million, that, that runs calendar year, so it's the 1st of January to the 31st of December. If you're looking at using your FIA, which is your um, your foreign investment allowance, that is 10 million and you need a tax clearance. So you need to do assets and liabilities. Again, we help clients with this. So it's free of charge service that we, we offer. Um, but essentially, you then have that from date of tax clearance issue. So if you get it in June, it runs June to June for one year, and then you'll have to reapply. Um, above that, it is possible. Obviously, you've got man and wife if, you, if you're married. But if you have 50, 60, 70 million, everyone thinks, oh, I'm trapped. You're not trapped. The, the borders are of actually of South Africa are very open. You do a special reserve bank approval. You can move more money than that. So it's really simple, right? No, it's not. It isn't as simple as you think. If you want to move money in the name of a company, you can't do it. You have to use an asset swap. If you want to do it in a trust, you can't, you can't use exchange control limits there. You have to, again, use it by an asset swap. So there are more complex uh, situations than, than that. But in a personal portfolio, uh, very, very simple to do. Um, okay, now if you are moving funds offshore, there's a couple of issues that you're going to come across, and there's a couple of terms that you probably have seen already. So the first is the first is custody. Okay, so custody, you should always know the custody of the asset that you're investing in. Like if you go and buy a share, where does that share sit? Where who is the custodian of the asset? It is incredibly important, and you'll be surprised at how few clients ask this question. They're kind of happy to say. Well, yeah, I looked on the website and I found this and I gave them like a couple of million bucks. And you're just like, that's crazy. <laughs> like, how do you do that? The, the transparency overseas is a lot lower. Um, and you need to understand where the custody of those assets actually sits. Um, which bank is it sitting with? What, what, what are the protections? Many of the international brokers run through what's called nominee companies. It splits the legal and beneficial ownership of a share. Um, it's very different to investing on something in the JSC, which you basically get a broker dealer account underneath and you are the beneficial and legal owner. You look on the shareholder register, you see your name, you feel very comfortable. You go and invest through a lot of international platforms. It runs through a nominee. On the shareholder register is their company's name. If you're investing through like IPPs or, or internet, like uh, the pension, uh, uh, per, at least not per pension policies, the, the wrapper funds, you again, you, you, you need to understand the custody of, of the asset. Okay, two other terms is, one is probate. When you invest overseas in, in your personal name especially, probate is the, is the process of proving a will. You need to understand, do I need a will overseas to, and to when, when you know, the event naturally comes? Um, what is going to happen to these assets? Uh, you know, for example, like, you know, if you look at a state duty, you, you know, just in Australia anyway, like that's, there, there's none. If you look in Guernsey, you, I think it's above $20,000. You need to, you need to have probate. You need to get letter, uh, what's it, letters of administration. So there are, the, and I can't go through all the territories because there's many, many different places that people invest, but we can go through a little bit of the important ones. So that is important to understand. Is this going to form part of my South African estate? Finally, the, the term CITUS gets used a lot. Now, CITUS is like where is the, okay, it, it, it's, a, it's a branch of law that deals with where property is situated. And it generally, uh, you know, CITUS becomes an issue between movable and immovable property, but it's essentially what jurisdiction that, like is going to apply to this to this asset. Uh, if you have a house in UK and a house in France and a house in Germany, those legal frameworks apply in the different, in the different territories. Um, now, CITUS can be a problem. Uh, especially for UK and US assets, uh, if you're investing in your in your own name. So, this is just to give you a quick example. And like I said, I, I cannot run through this like because there's just too many countries, too many territories. So this is just to give you a flavour of the kinds of things that you need to be thinking about if you're actually investing, you're making a direct investment offshore without using local partners or going through a local exchange. Um, Okay, if you if you okay, so South Africa, okay, just to explain the tax quickly, South Africa is a residency-based tax system. So those guys that think, oh, I'm going offshore, I'm going to hide all my money from SARS because I don't want to pay them because they wasted the money. Um, that whole concept, you know, as long as you're maintaining your South African residency, you are still South African. You are still going to be taxed on those assets, whether they're international assets or local assets. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, when it comes to estate duty, for example, it's 20% on assets under 30 million. Um, 
Now, the, the thing that mo a lot of people don't understand, okay, you've obviously got the, the exemption up to 3.5 million on estate duty. South Africa, your, your tax rate, I mean, we all think, oh, we are the, the highest tax people in the world. Um, your estate duty is only 20%. As a non-resident of the US and the UK, your limits are very different. The US is only $60,000. So if you have assets in your own name that you've moved into the U.S. and have gone and bought shares, depending on how it's structured, and like I said, it's very, very personal, there is a chance that you could potentially pay 40% on, on a state duty. That is a major problem. Uh, the U.K., uh, 325,000 pounds. Once you're above that limit, again, 40%. There's no double uh, double taxation agreements to 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 sort of hinder that. Now, there are ways of structuring through nominees that make it make it acceptable, but it starts to be things that you need to think about and you need to understand where you invested. You didn't just go offshore and say, oh, well, now I can buy Google and Facebook and, and Apple and I'm all fine because I've got this great international broker. Uh, is he actually understanding what your requirements are? Do, do they specialize in South African citizens? This is, this is something that you must think about. Okay, so what are the pros and cons of, of investing through... An offshore exchange, like directly offshore versus locally. So obviously the the, the huge pro for investing local, like investing offshore but locally, and I'm going to think about it in terms of the buckets as well, is your tax administration is so much simpler if you're investing locally. Um, you know, are you going to diversify your asset base by using a, a local a local product? Absolutely you are. If you're linking to international assets, even though you're not taking your money through exchange controls, you still have a simpler, a simpler um, uh, tax administration. Will you improve performance? Your performance is going to be directly linked to the international market that you're, you're investing in. Where if you're going through what we're going to chat about in a bit, IDX futures and you're buying Teslas, you have Tesla's share price movement. It's an exchange listed uh, traded product and it's, and it's, um, and you get the exact same movement whether you're taking the money offshore and bought Tesla as well. Will you pay less tax? It's a good question. It's a difficult question to answer because it's so personal and it so much depends how you've structured it. Um, but essentially, there's a good chance that you will actually pay less tax by doing it via South Africa. And even if you don't pay less tax, because there are ways of, uh, in Guernsey, there's certain structures that you can do that will reduce the tax. There's various endowments you can use that will reduce your tax rate. But but using those products, you might pay less tax, but it often increases your your your, your fees to a level that it almost it doesn't become worth paying the tax. And I, I've seen it time and time again, the guys that go through the Mauritian trusts and they think they're gonna, or, yeah, we had a client that was going through a Swiss trust a while ago and we kind of looked at the asset base and said, this, this whole structure is crazy because you're paying more in fees than you're ever gonna save in tax. It's, you know, it's it's kind of, it almost becomes like a moral thing, but, um, but, but certainly, there are many ways using local products instead that you will be able to actually reduce your tax burden. Now, and one of them is just using, uh, like a lot of the local products are TFSA friendly. You can stick these local products as offshore products in your tax-free savings account, and you don't have to pay any tax. <laughs> so even more efficient than than trying to ferret it away and then getting caught. And I mean, we've got we've got clients that literally come and say, oh, but my plan is I'm just gonna buy Krugerrands and stick them in my pocket and drive across the border. and or fly and hide them. And you kind of say to them, like, if you reduce all your wealth into Kruger and stick them in your pocket, like, you can't live a normal life overseas. <laughs> you know, this is not a viable externalization strategy that you have. You have like petrol and grocery money for life. Well done. But you can't buy assets because immediately AML regulation is going to catch up to you. Like I said, global common reporting standards these days, you're not going to get away with it. They're going to say, where did this money come from? And you're going to be immediately like the money laundering. You're going to be flagged for money laundering, essentially, whether you are laundering money or not. So... It's, yeah, it is, uh, it is, there are many pros. Now, there are cons to investing locally as well. Now, um, systemic risks is, is one of them. Now, it depends on what you believe is the, the reason that you're moving offshore. As I said, these are the, the, the kind of like, I'd say diversify asset base, the most viable reason to invest offshore. Uh, improved performance. Also, a very good reason to improve offshore. As I said, the biggest, most innovative companies, the variety of products, which is another uh, pro to investing directly, is, is larger. But um, are you going to escape systemic risks? Now, it's a difficult one to answer because there are people that believe that we are headed towards Zimbabwe uh, or um, you, you know, Venezuela or something, you know, something to that effect. If that happens, you know, potentially if you have assets locally, maybe you could see them... I don't know. 
that that's something that you've got to make the call for. What I can say is that a lot of the offshore jurisdictions that people are investing in have far greater problems than South Africa, and the systemic risks are much, much higher. So it's something to consider, but uh, at the same time, if you look at something like an exchange, when you're looking at like these uh, kind of like uh, policies that you can buy out of the Seychelles and, and, and really obscure the, the source of funds, the problem with those are like the, the, the risk to those defaulting is high. You've got massive counterparty risk. When you're investing on an exchange, there is no counterparty risk, which is just so fantastic. It is so transparent um, that it, it adds a lot. Um, Okay, so obviously the cons uh, are if you are going uh, to invest locally, uh, you or at least if you invest, I don't know which way around I've done this. Um, you know, if the, the cons of investing internationally directly, directly at least, are you are going to obviously need structuring, need wrappers. Um, the one thing that, like I suppose, investing locally, the, the the con of investing locally is that you have less control over your FX conversion, which I, I think is a valid point as well. Um, when you're investing in a basket product, you don't know when they're going to shift the currency. And there's a lot of money to be made in that business. And because of that, um, there is, you know, there's a potential that, that you're not getting as transparent pricing as if you went direct. But uh, on the whole, you know, it, it should mirror, I mean, the, the tracking errors are pretty low, so it should, should mirror it. So those are kind of the pros and cons of investing uh, offshore locally through the exchange. So I just want to kind of look at the, the different products that, you, that you're investing in. And, and they're essentially broken down into three baskets. So the three baskets are, um, you can invest obviously in the ETFs and the ETF suite is getting larger in South Africa as well. So I've just put a, a lot of different ones. Everyone kind of thinks of S&P 500 as, as a big one. There's, there's I think four or five S&P 500 contracts listed, like ETFs at the, at the moment listed. Uh, the costs used to be quite prohibitive. I used to think that they were fairly expensive, but the costs have come down very nicely over the last little bit. They've become far more competitive with international markets. You've got the MSCI World, NASDAQ. You also aren't limited to equity when you're investing in exchange traded funds. Um, you've got things like the City World Go uh, Government Bond Index. You've also got global property REITs. You can get into property. Uh, ETFs, obviously, a diversified basket of underlying assets. And you've got a lot of equity structure products as well that you can invest in. Um, a little segment of the market that I think very few people know about in South Africa, but could be very exciting, is something called IDX Futures. Now, IDX Futures, okay, so this is not so much the, the long-term investing. This is more if you have a view on a Tesla or a, a Amazon or Volkswagen. There's, about th there's over 300 IDX Futures trading at the moment. Um, there's market makers on these things, and you can trade IDX Futures uh, on local SAFX markets. So... The big benefits of it is there's no need for exchange control, so you're not going to pay for the currency conversion on the way out. Um, you are, and obviously you're not trading OTC products at the moment. So a lot of the international products, whether you're looking at options or or CFDs, these are OTC products and carry counterparty risk. This is an exchange traded product. A lot of the hedge funds in South Africa make use of these products for the international exposure. Um, Bigger private clients use them as well. Uh, hedge funds, yeah, I was, I was chatting to the market maker yesterday before the presentation because I was kind of like, just give me a feel for what's happening in the IDX market at the moment. And it's, it's kind of one of the, the, the main market makers in South Africa. They, they're saying that the, basically hedge funds are mainly trading, um, trading the indices, uh, whereas the private investors are actually going for the ind individual named stocks. So they're going for the Amazons and the Volkswagens and, the, uh, and all the underlying products. And then finally, the idea that investing in the local market you know, is a terrible idea because you know, offshore markets are so much more exciting is also not exactly accurate. You might not have the variety that you have of going directly offshore, but we have very good offshore companies that are fortunately listed here. We are a very international market. And it's the likes of Richmond, which had numbers out today. The online sales growing very nicely. Um, you've got things like British American Tobacco, which has been absolutely decimated in the last couple of uh, uh, couple of years. But you know, if you look at British American Tobacco, a lot of that decimation, I think, is also coming because it used to be traded. You know, when interest rates in the U.S. fell to almost nothing, guys were like kind of picking up uh, you know, British American Tobacco as, as a proxy for for bonds. They were like, oh, it's a big stable company that pays a high dividend. That's what we kind of want it's because we can't, we can't get yield on bonds. Um, now with the U.S. interest rates coming down, South African interest rates coming down, that might be something that, that's becoming more interesting. Um, and then you've got things like capital and counties. You've got property funds that invest wholly outside of South Africa that you can access with through a simple stockbroking account. Go in and buy them for next to nothing, and and you get uh, oh, you get get all the 
all the benefit of, of being offshore, essentially. So there are certainly many options uh, to, to invest locally offshore and many reasons to as well. Okay, so I'm going to go through our favorite offshore investment picks. So the first one is the obvious one, and it's because <laughs> I'm so battered and bruised from these presentations of the last couple of years picking JSC small cap. But um, it's, the big, it's, it's one of the biggest contracts in the world. It's basically the, the contract that Warren Buffett selected for his wife. He said, when I pass away, and this is the greatest stock picker, it's the Oracle of Omaha, the greatest stock picker of all time. He says, when I pass away, I just want my wife to invest in, I think it was the Vanguard product, so it, it basically S&P 500. So that's the index that I've kind of selected as, as, as one of the best. The reason is I've already kind of gone through a lot of them, which is that it, it holds some of the most innovative companies in the world. It is fairly expensive. Um, but it's, you know, there's a reason for that. There's a reason the world is changing fundamentally, and, and there's a reason it keeps going up, uh, going up. Another very good reason to try and do a contract like this, you know, for all the good reasons of wanting to own the U.S. markets, um, owning a contract like this instead of going direct is you can start with as little as 500 grand a month or, or a lump sum of 10 grand. That's, how, that's the, the entry criteria. You can make it a regular savings product. You can't make a direct investment overseas a regular savings product because your 500 rand a month, at the moment, I think the international settlement fee is 350 bucks. So 350 bucks is going to international settlement. You can't do it. It's just not viable. If you've got investments under 100,000, you probably shouldn't be looking at, at direct offshore investments. But um, this is a great way to start building up capital locally Interne with international exposure, fits in tax-free savings accounts. Um, it's, it's okay. So I've picked. Okay, so like I said, there's a couple of S&P contracts. So I've picked um, the Signia product, uh, which is a Signia Itrix S&P 500. Um, it's a fairly new product, uh, and it's uh, yeah, I like I like it because one Signia is listed, so you can go and look at their results, and there's a, a high degree of transparency. It's very very new, so it was uh, well. Obviously, the index is very old and the methodology is very old. Like the product is fairly new, but since October 2017, they've already raised just under a billion for the for the product, which is a, a good go. But out of all the the S&P 500 contracts on on our market, it's got the lowest. Whoops, it's got the lowest total expense ratio. So not it's 16 basis points. It's still a little bit more expensive than the US because the Vanguard products I think get five basis points. But um, like I said, you just can't do the things that you can do with the local product. Um, you, know, you look at some of the competing uh, products, 25, one of them is actually 50 basis points as well. So very, very good. The kind of companies you're getting on, uh, inside this, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Berkshire Hathaway, Johnson Johnson, Alphabet, ExxonMobil, uh, and JP Morgan Chase. So big, large cap, mega companies that are bigger than countries. Um, and yeah, it's uh, yeah. So that's that's the first pick. So I don't know how you do better than the first pick because it's basically Warren Buffett's pick, and it's going to be amazing. Um, so I've tried. I've, so we've gone with something better, which I don't know how we found this, but it's um, it's basically called the S&P 500 Digital Plus. So this is. Um, this is an equity structured product, so it's a little bit different, and it's actually you can't compare them directly, but um, there are there are aspects that are the same. So essentially, they're linking to the same index. So essentially, what a structured product does is it it takes an investment goal of an investor, and it kind of you can you know with financial engineering you can contract and and you can kind of move around where the risks. Are that you want to take, and you can put them in places where you like them, and you can kind of take it away. I mean, you can do anything with like financial engineering. It's 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 amazing. But um, essentially, this product, just to give you a, like a breakdown, it it is essentially an S&P 500 index that you're linking to. It's a three and a half year lock-in. So the one thing that you do here that's different from a, a straight ETF is that you're giving away some of your liquidity. An ETF, the ETF before, you can buy and sell at a moment's notice and three days later settlement, you have the money in your account. Here, you, you're locking in for three and a half years. There is a willing buyer, willing seller, but these aren't liquid. So the ticker is going to be SPIB32. Um, it will be listing, uh, it will be trading on the 6th of September. So these these kind of products, you also, they term products. So you go in ahead of time. Um, they, yeah, so it's, it's listing there. So you have to kind of have apps. It's almost like an IPO. You have to have all your applications in before the 2nd of September if, you, if you're interested in this kind of thing. And they come out regularly, but every time they're a little bit different. Um, now, what happens inside the product? So this is called the Digital Plus. So essentially, you get an S&P tracker, but if the S&P 500 ends positive, just positive, you immediately get 44% return. 
If it ends higher than 44%, you get all the upside as well. At the same time, you get capital protection. Um, so that's a little bit obscure the way that they've worded it, but you get you get 100% capital protection. You get all your money back as long as the index is down less than 40%. It's not a barrier. So it means it can trade through 40%. As long as it ends above 40%, you, um, you get all your money back in a falling market. If it falls more than 40%, obviously you take the downside. So that sounds very complicated. So minimum investment's also 100,000. So it's a little bit, that's another thing that you're giving up is you can't access it like uh, regularly. Uh, as a regular saver, but it's it's kind of a lump sum product. Um, with it, so this is like kind of a visual representation of exactly what happens on the product. So the do, the dashed line there. So, so let me see if I've got a uh, the dashed line there is your is your S and P 500, which makes sense. If S and P 500 goes up 30 percent, what is your return? You get 30 percent, which is great. So because obviously S&P 500 goes up 60 percent, you're going to get 60 percent because that's the dashed line there. If the S&P 500 drops 40 percent, so it gives you so you've got 60 percent. So this is your principal. So it's 60 percent of your principal left. You get negative 60 percent. That's what happens if you buy an S&P 500 contract and the markets collapse. If the markets are going up, you do it very very well. Now, so what does this product do? Essentially, it puts in the capital, uh, like a capital protection floor. So there's your 100% capital protection. So if the market falls 30%, so the dotted line is the market. If the market falls 30%, your return is going to be on the red line. So the red line essentially gives you all your money back. All the way down, the market falls 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, uh, basically, sorry, 40%. You get all your money back if you're 100% guaranteed. If you fall more, so if you fall 50%, then you suddenly turn back into an index tracker. So basically, you're going to do what the S&P 500 index has done. Uh, on the on the flip side, you've got a digital coupon on on the product. So what happens is if the market goes up 10%, instead of earning 10%, you earn 44%. If the market goes up 30 30%, you go up. 44%. So this whole area here, whatever the market does, you're going to do more than that. If it turns back into a tracker, well, like obviously if you get more, you then match the market on the way up. So what it's essentially trying to do is it's trying to contract your return into these two periods of outperformance. If the market, if you think that you're going to go into S&P 500, the market's going to kind of toddle along for a while, um, you kind of want, to, you, you're going to get outperformance essentially. If the market falls a little bit, you're going to get better than the market. If the market rises a little bit, but not a lot, you're going to get outperformance. And the only time that you're going to get underperformance is essentially in these two situations where you're going to kind of do the market but obviously you have uh, the uh, the dividends are also removed in this product, so you lose the dividends as well. Um, also, you you got to be be aware that this is uh, this, there's a currency conversion in this product as well, so there is currency risk to the product. Um, sorry, let me just go to the next slide, and then I'll just give you there's a little bit of back testing on the product as well, which is um, over here. So this is essentially yeah. So so there's there's a couple of risks to this product that you need to understand as well. It, like I said, it's not directly comparable to an S&P 500 index, in that an S&P 500 index um, gives you basically like direct exposure into those companies. This is a reference instrument, so you have credit risk on this. It's it's kind of like it's, it's got a credit risk. The credit risk on this product is standard charted. So when you're buying structured products like this, you normally do kind of a, like a smaller amount into each one. But if you have a look at the uh, rolling return over time. Uh, you can see essentially like this is going back 30 years worth of what would have happened over a 3.5 year period if you had bought the product. All the squiggly lines here, all of these ones, that's where you've done um, you, basically the product, like the S&P 500 index has done more than the 40, 44% and you've gained more than 44% on your investment. All of these flat lines here, so that line there, those ones are where the, you can see the, the red line, so the, red, the, the blue line over here is underneath that. So the market didn't quite make the 44% level, so the product boosted them up to the 44% level. Um, then at the same time, you've got this zero, this, this like kind of flat region here. That's obviously where the market fell. The market fell hard, as is possible with an equity investment. The market falls hard, it returns all the capital, and 0.3% of the time. So there are times where the product turned back into that tracker, um, is essentially that little dip there, that little dip there, and that little dip there. Those are the three times where when the market collapsed more than 40%, you got basically your product back and you got you got capital losses on the product. So it's a little bit more aggressive than the 100% capital products we've done in the past. Um, but yeah, it's it's an exchange traded product as well. Uh, yeah, and there's yeah, like I said, there, yeah, that's that's kind of that product. Uh, how am I doing for time? 
like uh, I've got like five five minutes. So we got one more one more pick as well, which is this was actually for like Paul, who's the JSC marketing director. He's uh, asked me to explain NASPA <laughs> and what's happening with process. He says you definitely gonna get questions about that, so just stick it in the presentation. So yeah, NASPA and process, like another great example of a company that you invest in locally that has access to some of the most exciting offshore markets uh, available. Um, and we all kind of know NASPAS, I think. I think most people know NASPAS, giant investment in Tencent, the Chinese internet company. And it's essentially, the, I suppose, the, it's like a combination of Google and Facebook of China and huge gaming revenues and a lot of, a lot of things, uh, a lot of media assets as well. But um, NASPAS is a very well-known stock. What's happening with NASPAS, they are going to list uh, the international an uh, assets in Amsterdam in an attempt to narrow the discount between their um, the, basically, the, the, whole, the holding company structure, they're trying to narrow the discount that they trade at to Tencent, and they're trying to get it to, to reflect a bit more accurately. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so we were going to have this all come through uh, yeah, in the next, it was actually going to list yesterday. It was going to list on the 17th, but someone sent the wrong information to shareholders in their little packs, so they had to delay the listing. So this used to be the timeline of, of what was going to happen to your NASPAS shares, and if you have NASPAS shares, I'm sure a lot of you do, uh, you have to make an election, and the election is complex, and people are worried about it. So essentially what NASPAS is doing is, okay, so they, uh, I wish I could flick back and forwards here, but um, yeah, so they, essentially they're going to, okay, NASPAS is going to split. And you've got an election to make, and you were going to have to make that election earlier in the month, and it was going to, you know, it was going to kind of like we're going to have an extraordinary general meeting, and then they were going to, you know, list on the 17th of July, which was yesterday, but it hasn't happened, and it'll be sometime, I think, in September that it's going to be, but uh, essentially what's going to happen is you've got the choice now, so you have NAS, currently have NASPAS N shares, um, you've got the election either to, to take more NASPAS shares, or you can take shares in the new company, which is Process, which are the international assets, so What's going to happen is either you're going to have NASPAS shares and you're going to get one for one uh, NASPAS M shares, which will then convert into process shares later on. Um, or you've got the choice to say, I want to keep my NASPAS shares. So I've got NASPAS shares and because they don't want to dilute you, for every NASPAS share, they're going to give you 0.36% uh, of another NASPAS share. So you're either going to have NASPAS plus more NASPAS or you're going to have NASPAS plus process. Now, the problem with that is if you elect to have process, which a lot of people I think are excited to do, they're like, oh, we want this because the process is going to inwardly list on the JSE. So they're going to say, oh, we want process shares because we want to have the international assets and we want to be separate from, from NASPAS. The problem is it's going to generate a capital gains tax event for, for, for investors, but you're not going to be selling anything, so you're not actually going to have capital available to pay the capital gains. And, and I know investors are worried. We've been chatting to our client base. We had a guy phone in the other day. And he was, he's just bought an NASPAS. He was like, I'm so worried about the capital gains tax event. I was like, you don't have, really have one. So, so it's, 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 it's kind of like, it's, it's difficult to explain, but it's, it's also the decision isn't a simple one where I can say that's the better route of, of doing it. It's going to come down to how much of a capital gain do you have inside your, your NASPAS? Have you been holding NASPAS for 25 years? Or have you, you know, have you just bought NASPAS? What is the size of the, the, the capital gain as well? Um, yeah, and essentially, I think what we're, you know, it, again, it depends, but we do believe that there is going to be an unwinding of the discount. The, the, the drawback to holding NASPAS directly and, and taking more NASPAS shares is with NASPAS kind of like sitting in South Africa, and, and I mean, if I go back to the ownership structure, NASPAS is essentially going to own Process, who's going to own Tencent. It's going to be like two layers of management companies, which is like, you know, every time there's a management company, it kind of adds a discount. Um, but so that's the, the the one aspect of it, but on the other side, like the the idea of opening up the the shareholder base to 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 the international markets. The, the problem is like South African funds go and buy twenty percent in NASPERS, and they kind of like can't buy any more because they're at they're at, at limits because they're given their mandate. Um, so they haven't been able to narrow the discount to ten cent. And there's a very good argument to be made that when it does list, you're going to see that discount start, discount start to narrow. So then buying ten cent NASPERS now with the view that that discount is going to narrow is a very valid um, valid uh, thesis. Uh, we'll see how it pans out. Um, the, 
on the other side of it, there's there's the argument that you are essentially buying two holding companies as well. So rather take the process share because all you're going to do if you've got the funds to pay the capital gains tax, you're going to pay that capital gains tax one day anyway. You might as well pay it now because if you wait, there is the chance that, you know, given the state of the South African fiscus, the capital gains tax might be going up. So, hey, let's pay it now. And and if, if capital gains tax goes up, yeah, you know, you might win. Uh, the problem is, of course, if you pay all the capital gains tax, then process and nice but fall for some reason. You've kind of paid tax, but you never should have. So it's it's not a nice choice that investors have ahead of them, but it's the choice we've been given. Um, and it does, unfortunately, come down to, to individuals. I think, yeah, at the moment for larger accounts, we're probably recommending holding on to the NUSPAS directly um, unless there's no capital gain event. But uh, that that's something that you must definitely chat to Viv, who's sitting in the back there, Viv, stick up your hand. Uh, if you've got questions about it, he can take you through that uh, is probably the best guy to do it. But um, that is my presentation. Thank you for listening.